And welcome to the Late Kick is Live. It is Sunday night, July 10th, the year of our Lord, 2022. Mark my words, the most important episode of this show, maybe that we've ever done. We are jam-packed, high atop, just a spirited downtown Nashville, Tennessee. There's a lot of drama out there right now, not just in Nashville. In the recruiting world, there's a lot of drama, specifically around Miami. So we got some myths that we need to address tonight. We have some just outright things that we need to address tonight. We have got several major announcements I'm going to talk more about in just a second. We got big swing games. I'm specifically looking at September, even more specifically week three and week four. Bold predictions hits chapter 23 tonight. I think we're going to make it to 30. I feel pretty confident in saying that recruiting is just insane right now. I cannot believe how hot recruiting is in July and what we would have thought about that 10 years ago. Recruiting calendar is totally different. If you're not paying attention to recruiting right now, it's akin to not paying attention to recruiting in January of 2005. I mean, that's what July has become, June and July, really. So strap in, because it's going to be a very, very jam-packed show. Dare I say more jam-packed than normal tonight. They're watching us in Chicago, Illinois. I'm told by way of Jacksonville. I'm looking at you, Billy. Welcome aboard. Uh, Siena, Italy is tuned in. Louisville, Kentucky, and Boca Raton, Florida. You will remember this show, as will we, for a long time. And the longer you've been with us, the more tonight's show will mean to you. We got so many major announcements that we actually were able to put one between each of our segments tonight. So yes, in true form, I'm going to string you through this entire live show, but it is live. So let's get to it. Luckily, we don't have a hard in and a hard out, so we can really just mosey along at our pace, but uh, happy to have you with us. So <laughs> there's a lot going on around here. A lot going on with the show. There's a lot going on with this company around here, too. That's where I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes tonight. I know our friends down in South Florida are tuned in with torch in one hand and pitchfork in the other hand and just drool coming out of their mouth. What am I talking about? Well, you may or may not be aware that, hey, recruiting, like I said, is hot, and Miami has been a big part of that lately. So Miami fans this weekend, it was kind of the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was every kind of time they could have. It was really good because Jaden Wayne committed to the U. And that's a really big pickup. Five-star edge guy, or is he? More on that in just a second. I saw the graphic. That's what it said at the time. So hey, I feel the same way you guys do. Anyway, he's a really, really good edge rusher from South Florida. He's at IMG. He's not from Florida, but he's at IMG. He commits to Miami. Is that a big headline to you? Well, no, not if you're in Norman, Oklahoma. Then it gets a little saucier. So a couple of hours after he commits, suspiciously, dare I say sketch affily, you see that 24-7 sports composite rating of Mr. Wayne drop from five-star to four-star. And then guess what happened, guys? Chaos. Utter chaos ensued. I felt so bad for David Lake and Gabby down there at the Miami site. They're just, I mean, they're, they're both leaned against the door trying to keep the natives out uh, to no avail because Miami fans rightly got upset at that. I, I know that you see this white t-shirt and you don't see a 24-7 or CBS label here. Um, I was made aware of this by you guys. Very rarely when these sorts of things happen am I made aware of it by people inside our company. I'm minding my business, and all of a sudden, I mean, I got tons of Miami folks that I converse with regularly, and they're asking, how dare you, you know, as if I did this. So how did this happen? Well, I'll tell you how it happened in just a second, but I get that 98% of you aren't affected by this, but boy, what I love about college football, what I love about the Miami fan base is they don't take time off. That's kind of why we do the show year-round. Like, our audience is sort of endemic of hardcore college football fans. It's a 12-month-a-year thing. There is no off-season. That's why we don't use the word on this show. I'm in a pretty unique spot, though. Here's why I felt the need to talk on this tonight. I can assure you management didn't tell me to. If anything, they would prefer I didn't uh, because of what I'm about to say. But I'm in a pretty unique position because, as most of you know, if you've watched the show for quite a while, I was a subscriber to this site long before I ever came to work here in any capacity. So I kind of have, I've got institutional knowledge now that I've been here a little while, but I didn't grow up in this industry. I was a subscriber, man. Like, I remember recruiting battles back in the early 2000s, and I remember 24-7 first coming to be. Like, I remember all that, just like most of you do. So what's unique about it is when Shannon Terry called me and ended up offering me a job here, I was excited, number one, because of the obvious. But number two, I was, hey, I'm kind of fascinated by recruiting, and I got to see behind the curtain. And so I've got the perspective of you guys. I still talk to you guys far more than maybe our folks here, uh, but also, I'm, I'm here now. 
So I can kind of see um, the mechanism at work. I can see behind the curtain a little bit. Here's what I want to tell you about what happened. And the explanation that's been given out by our team, it checks out. Like I, I did my due diligence on this. I made calls. What happened was you've got the 24 seven rating on a kid and then you got the composite rating on a kid. And for those unfamiliar with how this works, I'll bore you and spare you or spare you boring you with the details. But all it is is a composite system to where you take all the rankings from the entire industry and all the services and you bake it into one cake and voila. Problem is when a kid transfers from one state to another state, it really throws that into a blender because the kid's ranking may not change, but what happens are state rankings get changed and positional rankings get changed. And so when this kid transferred to IMG, I don't think that uh, whatever that composite system is, I don't pretend to know how it works. It didn't bake all that in. What happened Saturday when Jade and Wayne committed is there's a lot of tension on his account, on his profile, and someone realized, uh oh, we didn't properly refresh this. And so a couple of hours after he's committed, in one of the more tone deaf moves I've seen in quite a while around here, someone refreshed it. And it made a lot of people angry, as it should have. So I got no problem with you being irate about that. And I think I've talked to the Miami folks, I've been on the board today. I get that most of you understand the explanation you've been given checks out. Like that's not the craziest thing in the world. There was a technical oversight and you get it. And I, I can assure you that is what happened. But then the follow-up that I've gotten from most of my Miami brethren has been, but it's about the bigger picture. Yeah, if it was just that, it'd be one thing, but it's about the bigger picture. Now, when you guys say bigger picture, there are two different camps. Camp A just means, how could you allow that to happen? I got no real rebuttal there, okay? You're right to be angry about that. I can promise you there are some meetings scheduled bright and early tomorrow to address that. So your voices have been heard loud and clear. I saw some of you dragging management on social earlier today. It's only supposed to be me doing that. I cannot believe you guys took to doing that too. Uh, so God bless management for what they had to deal with today. They didn't really have their hands in that either. But at the end of the day, yeah, it's, like the, it's like Dunder Mifflin. When you put an obscene watermark on your butter stock, your most popular paper, and the lady comes and she, she wants vengeance, it's on you. She wants you to resign. I don't think anyone's resigning. But yeah, technical oversight notwithstanding. The other camp that says it's about the bigger picture, that's the camp I want to talk about. Because I really wanted to start the show with some of the myths that are out there. I'm going to talk about Notre Dame, weirdly, in a second. It's going to be a, a very abrupt transition. Uh, there is a notion, there is a belief out there amongst some of our Miami brethren. You're not alone. Pretty much every fan base has a portion of said fan base that believes this. And they believe that there is an inherent anti-Miami bias in the recruiting ranking process and then in the updated ranking process if and when a kid commits to Miami. Here's what you can do tonight. I cannot bring you up here and put you through a seminar. I cannot give you the Zoom password to the rankings council meetings. Here's what I can tell you and you can take it or leave it. I have no motivation to defend this company if they're doing something wrong. Those of you who have been around this show for quite a while know I mean that when I say that because you've heard me call us out when we need to be called out. And the reason I preface this with that is because I am telling you straight up, it's not happening. That doesn't happen here. And I know what you believe because I used to believe it. This is where the unique perspective comes in. You see, once upon a time, little JP here was a mere subscriber to these websites. And I had my teams that I liked, and I used to watch this process play out, and I used to watch guys commit, and I used to watch those star rankings fluctuate. Now, what stuck in my mind was never the kid who commits and then sees his ranking bump. I would only remember the kids who saw their ranking fall. That would stick in my mind, kind of like when you only remember when announcers say bad things about your team, but you never remember that they probably balance it out and then some by saying good things. None of that sticks in your mind, only the negative sticks in your mind. And so when I got here, I was confident. I told my buddies, man, I bet I see all kinds of bias in that ranking system. I even asked and was granted access to sit in on the rankings council meeting. It's one of the most boring things. If you don't care about that stuff, it's one of the most boring things that you could ever witness, but it is a very honest and straightforward process. I was a little disappointed, to be honest with you, because I thought that I was going to uncover something, and it's like turning over a rock and it's ants. That's all there is. There's no snake here, no vermin here, it's just ants. I'm not comparing our recruiting council to that, mind you. But here's what those guys do. Those guys go at it with each other. Uh, they, they stand on the table for certain kids. 
They want to get their eyeballs on as many kids as possible. But when it comes down to rating kids, it might as well be a blind resume that they're rating. Uh, very rarely, if ever, do you hear so much as a mention of what team a kid's committed to. Now, I will tell you where I guess a, a modicum of this may be true. If I'm on a rankings council, let's just say I'm on it for a second. I never have been, I never will be, I've never ranked a kid in my life. But if I were on that rankings council and I had a kid ranked two stars, just or, or unranked, I just haven't even bothered to rank him. He's outside my top 1,000. And I get text messages over a three-hour period that say Ryan Day, Nick Saban, and Dabo Swinney all offered him. Yeah, I'm probably more likely than I otherwise would have to give that kid a second look because I know as good as I may think I am, those guys are better and those guys may know something, especially all three of them at one time that I don't know. So yeah, if those big programs in unison move on a kid, they're probably going to get a second look disproportionate to the second look they would have gotten otherwise. I'll admit that. And that's me talking personally. I would do that. And so it would not surprise me if that happened at all. But to suggest, I just want you to be honest with me for a second now, to suggest that there is a motivation to knock kids who commit to Miami is ludicrous. Do you want me to tell you where the bias would be if there were any bias baked into this process? We have meetings all the time around here. It sounds just like conference realignment. It's kind of gross. Which, which markets are the biggest? Which ones do we need to make more impressions in? Do you understand how valuable the Miami market is? Just think this out loud now. You understand how valuable that is? If there were any bias around here, here's what it would sound like. It would be Wilt Fong, or it would be Cooper, or it would be Chris, or it would be somebody whispering in the other guy's ear, hey, this kid committed to Miami. Let's bump him a little bit. You know, if we're going to have some bias here, let's get us a stronger foothold in that Miami market. That's what it would sound like. Anyone around here who said, let's knock a kid because he committed to Miami would probably be fired before sundown, as they should, because it would be one of the stupidest things you could ever do. That's not happening. Uh, if it were happening, I can also assure you that Miami class wouldn't be parked inside the top 10 and probably about to elevate to the highest ranking they've had in the 24-7 sports era. That's all about to happen, by the way. I would bet a lot of money on that. So that's not happening. What did happen is an error that should never have occurred. That did happen this weekend. The other stuff, not happening. You can either take my word on that or you can leave it. You can call me a liar. That's fine. I'm telling you I'm not lying. I'm telling you I'm being honest about it. And I got a better perspective than any of you because I'm here. I know all those guys. I talk to all those guys. And I know how serious they are about it. That's one part of the myths that I wanted to knock down tonight. But just as sure as I was about to move on, the other day, someone else came at me with an entirely different myth. And they came at me with the old standby which is Notre Dame does not play a tough schedule. In fact, Notre Dame plays a soft schedule. So here's normally how this goes. You cannot have a sustainable data-based argument against Notre Dame's strength of schedule. It doesn't exist. Because any reputable data-based or analytical model out there tells you the same thing. Notre Dame plays a very strong schedule. In fact, most years it's top 15 in the country. Uh, to give you a data point of our own, our system, our model, preseason, has Notre Dame's schedule ranked 12th in the country this year. It'll fluctuate. I'm just saying we think highly of their schedule this year. So since you can't base it on data and logic, it quickly devolves into just pure emotion. Some of the most mindless, flawed logic in all of college football is reserved for Notre Dame's strength of schedule arguments. And once you get them off the rocker a little bit, because they can't back it up with numbers, it'll sound something like this. Well, they need to join a conference. Irrelevant. Well, they don't play a conference championship game. Irrelevant to the one through 12 argument. If you want to argue with me that it's wrong that Notre Dame doesn't have to play a conference title game, I'll be happy to have the argument with you. I may even agree with you. It's going to be a separate argument. That doesn't impact how strong their one through 12 is. Their one through 12 is the only matter on the table right now. And so then they continue. I mean, our buddy Chris Marler came at me with his trash today. Said, you know what proves that Notre Dame plays a soft schedule? What's that, Christopher? They get blown out every time they go to the playoff. Well, so would everybody else. I didn't tell you that Notre Dame was the best program in the country. I, I didn't tell you that they were a top four program in the country. I told you they don't play a weak schedule. In fact, they can get beat by 150 every time they go to the playoffs. It says nothing about their strength of schedule. If you want to argue whether they should have had to play a conference title game, if you want to argue whether they're overrated or not, whatever. They play the schedule they play. But that leads into another argument that I always have. And that's the Notre Dame is overrated argument. To me, Notre Dame has been for quite a while the most easily rated team in America. It's so easy to see where they fit in. They're not Bama. 
They're not Clemson. They're not Ohio State. They're not two or three other pro maybe Oklahoma you could include in there over the past decade. And then Notre Dame is situated somewhere behind them, somewhere in that four to eight range. That's where Notre Dame sits. That is so easy to see if you apply data and logic. Then people come at you and say, what about when they've gone to the playoff? Undress it. Keep going. Yeah, keep talking. You've got the losing argument here, so keep talking. Uh, well, then they just go like this for a second, and then they say, yeah, well, they got, they got blown out by Bama. I didn't say they were better than Bama. You said they were overrated. They weren't favored against Bama. They shouldn't have beaten Bama. Continue. Well, they got blown out by Clemson. They were, they were a dog against Clemson. No one said they were better than Clemson. I'm saying they're rated four through eight, and every time they play a team rated higher than four through eight, they should lose to them. And then every time they play a team behind them, last 10 years says they're probably better than them. Like Notre Dame's so easy to figure out. I've never gotten how people get so out of whack on this, but it's probably the same reason a lot of people are worked up about this whole conference realignment deal and whether they should or shouldn't join a conference. Now, I just wanted to lead off the show with a couple of those myths. It's probably going to be a segment we dive into a lot more in the coming weeks because I got so many more submissions from you on the uh, biggest myths that we need to bat away like a pinata front. So appreciate you guys being tuned in. Okay, we got so many big announcements. Here's the first one. You know what normally happens in this position in this show? Any of our veterans, or you know what, even if you're like a sophomore and you've been around here a few weeks, you know this is the time normally where if you're a good member of the audience, you stick around and you patronize the sponsor. And if you're a little more casual in nature, you hit the fast forward button. Don't hit the fast forward button tonight, friends. This is where the Academy Sports and Outdoors ad read normally goes. I don't have you an ad read tonight, at least not a traditional one. What I do want to tell you is I normally hem haw around a little bit and I tell you, boy, you make this show special. Boy, those folks at Academy really love you. And I think a lot of you believe that, but I don't know that all of you believe that. Well, allow me to present the most compelling bit of evidence that I could possibly present to you. As of Friday morning, we finalized the deal with Academy Sports and Outdoors to become the presenting sponsor on this show. Some of you who have existed in this business before know what I just said. It's a total game changer. For the 99% of you who have never worked in the media industry, let me tell you, that is a tier one sponsorship. They literally could not invest any more in this show if they wanted to. When I have told you for months and months and months that you were making special things happen behind the scenes, it's because I was getting weekly feedback from Academy Sports and Outdoors where they said, these interactions with your audience are insane. They tag us every day. They're taking pictures of their receipts. They're going in our stores and asking the cashier if they know you. Short answer, no, at least not yet. Hopefully one day they will. And they have now invested into this show that's just two years old, started from scratch a couple of years ago during a pandemic, to the degree that you will never have to worry about paying for this thing. This show is going to be free forever, thanks to our partners and our presenting sponsor now at Academy Sports and Outdoors. It ain't just Late Kick with Josh Pate anymore. Starting September 1, it is the Late Kick with Josh Pate presented by Academy Sports and Outdoors. I cannot even begin to tell you how big that is financially for this company, financially for this brand, but for you, that means you get to tune into this thing and never have to worry about it moving somewhere, changing, all of a sudden it's behind a paywall, none of that. We're blessed enough to have a partner that believes in us and invests in us. Uh, that is about 1% because of us and 99% because of you. That is announcement one out of the way. Thank you for that. It is beyond huge for us. We got three more to come. Just getting started. Bold predictions, chapter 23. Can you believe we've made it this far? These are the things that you have claimed. And then you followed it up with, and I would bet my money on it if you made me. Let's dive into bold predictions, chapter 23 tonight. How about conference championship matchups? Man of hate hit us up. Hmm. Not a single Power 5 conference championship game will be a repeat of last year's matchup. Much love from a fellow Fountain City native. That's Columbus, Georgia, to the layperson out there. I made this a 7 on the boldness scale. Now, here's a quick recap. If you're listening on podcast, you need to listen here. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see. Last year's conference title rematches. Pitt versus Wake Forest. To give you an idea, uh, preseason odds this year. Pitt is the second odds-on favorite in their division. Wake Forest is third. So neither of them are favored to get the conference title game. Next up in the Big 12, Baylor versus Oklahoma State. Baylor has the fourth best odds in the Big 12. Oklahoma State has the third best odds. So probably going to see a different matchup there. Uh, we move on. What about Michigan versus Iowa? In the Big 10, Michigan has the second best odds 
in their division behind Ohio State, obviously, and Iowa has the third best odds. In the Pac-12, Utah versus Oregon. They have the second and third best odds to win the conference, and it's all kind of neck and neck up there. Anyway, you hear what I'm telling you so far. We don't have a one versus one matchup here. In fact, none of these teams so far are favored to make it back to their conference title games. Then you get to Bama, Georgia, and they are the overwhelming favorites in the SEC to both make it to the championship game in their respective divisions. So the prediction here is we won't have a single rematch in conference title games. The first four I read you, it's easy to see. I mean, I could easily see a world where neither Pitt nor Wake Forest even make the ACC title game. Ditto in the Big 12 of Baylor, Oklahoma State. The SEC is what's in your way here. Because obviously, you're looking at the odds. If you're listening on podcast, Georgia is a plus 120 favorite to win the East. Kentucky is plus 4,000. That's how overwhelming the odds are for Georgia. Bama's minus 140 to win the West. A&M is a plus 1,600. That's to win the SEC championship. But it's giving you, it's giving you an idea of how wide the gap is between the teams. I made this a seven. I think it's bold to say you won't have a single rematch. It's just because of the SEC. Because outside of that, this wouldn't be bold at all. The SEC is what potentially could get in your way there. Next up, oh, this was a fun one here. Close your eyes in Austin. Kyle said at the end of the year, there will be three teams, count them, three teams from the state of Texas ranked higher than the Longhorns. Checking in from San Antonio, Texas. So stats and info, or as you may know him, producer Jesse, he said, we got seven candidates here, really. So with all due respect to Rice, food is not going to enter into this equation. We got Houston, a and Baylor, TCU, SMU, Texas Tech, and UTSA. Those reasonably could be there. But here's what you really need to know. For three teams in this state to finish higher than Texas, we're probably looking at Houston, a and UTSA, and Baylor. We're probably choosing from them. Houston's over-under win total is nine. a and is eight and a half. UTSA is eight and a half. And by comparison, Texas is nine. So there are three other teams in Texas that have an over-under win total of at least eight. In fact, Baylor, UTSA, a and and Houston. So there are four of them, aside from Texas, that have over-under win totals of at least eight. This all falls on Quinn Ewers, though, doesn't it? Because it really doesn't matter what UTSA does, all due respect. If Texas is taking care of business, if they're winning nine or ten games, they're ranked higher than UTSA. And so that all falls on Quinn Ewers. And if he plays even remotely up to what you think potential is and what you think capability is, so many of those other pieces fall in place. Think about what Isaiah Nayer is. You know, the Wyoming wide receiver transfer. What is he if Quinn Ewers pans out? It, all that stuff falls into place. Xavier Worthy could be an All-American in his sophomore campaign if Quinn Ewers pans out. You know, I get kind of quiet there because that's the, the million-dollar question, or in his case, multi-million-dollar question in Austin. I can see one or maybe even two of these teams finishing higher ranked than Texas. Uh, short of like an injury situation, which we don't predict on the show, I don't see three of them doing it. So I made this an eight. I've got some confidence in Texas this year like I didn't necessarily have last year. I'm not telling you they're winning the Big 12. I just need them to be ranked higher than, than Baylor or Texas Tech or TCU or something like that. So I'm going to call it an eight. I think it's a, a little too bold for my taste. Let's go over to the SEC East for a second. How about this one? This one's pretty bold. South Carolina, going to go two and two against these four teams. At Arkansas, home versus Georgia, home versus a and at Clemson. South Carolina's defense also takes a huge leap under second-year coordinator Clayton White. So uh, all due respect to Coach White there, I'm, I'm mainly going to focus on the predicted records here. Uh, this one's an eight. This is tough to see. Not impossible. Tough to see, though. This is why I keep warning about properly gauging progress under Shane Beamer year two at South Carolina. Look, there is a, certainly a world where they pull a couple of big-time upsets. In fact, if there were a program out there that were going to be a candidate to do that this year, I'd probably look at South Carolina. I mean, they had a really good portal class, highlighted by Spencer Rattler, obviously. Uh, that year two magic that sometimes we see, hey, if it's going to happen somewhere, why not happen at South Carolina? But you got to understand something. Uh, think about last year. You know, I agree with you if you tell me South Carolina overachieved last year. They did, okay? Here's the problem, and it shows you how wide a gap you got to make up. South Carolina, in an overachievement year last year, they played three of these teams. Uh, they played Texas A&M, 
they played Georgia. They, I mean, they played, um, yeah, they played Bama, whoever. They, listen, they lost three of these games by 27 or more last year. So there were three of these opponents that were already on their schedule last year, and they got housed by them. Clemson was the other one. They got housed by them. So there is a lot that has to be made up here. So we were looking to pull two upsets. They're on the road at Arkansas. They are on the road at Clemson. I've got to figure, you know, you're trying to start early. You get Arkansas in week two. If you pull that off and you come home and you got Georgia, maybe you have the hornet's nest there and you, you, you catch Georgia early in the season, young defense. Listen, yeah, there, there's certainly a path for it. I think it's unlikely, but here's what I want to know. Are you losing games by three or four touchdowns again? Or do you have a situation where, you know, we're, we're losing to Georgia 30 to 20? Uh, we're losing to Texas A&M 27-26. That's a different world than what we saw last year. So I'm going to call that an eight. It is very bold, though not impossible. Next up, this would be tough to stomach there on the uh, East Coast. ACC left out of the playoff again this year. Big Ten's going to have one team. Big 12 will have one team. SEC has two teams. Um, okay, Jared, here's what I'm going to do. That was from Jared. Going to ignore that second part. I'm just going to focus on the ACC part because that would become way too cluttered here. I called this a six because it's really on Clemson. I, until further notice, this is a Clemson thing. If Clemson makes it, then you're wrong. And if they, or if they make it, you're right. And if they, if they miss out, you're wrong. The ACC getting left out, it's only happened once since the playoffs inception, which was in 2014. And that was last year. So I guess you're looking to make it a streak here. It, I think it's still Clemson or bust in 22. If they're not, you're probably looking at Miami. Um, you're looking at a long shot there. But the reason why I made this a six is I, th I think there's some boldness to it, but there are two schools of thought. Either Clemson just makes it and it's a moot point, or they miss out. And then the second part of that is if Clemson misses out, you have to make sure no one knocked them out to the point where that team in and of themselves were qualifiers for the playoffs. So you need like a, a one or a two loss team probably in the ACC title game, or you know, maybe Clemson just drops a couple of games early so their playoff resume is thrown in the wood chipper, but they're still good enough to just, just beat a bunch of battered teams and route to an ACC championship. I, I think the ACC is going to find a way to be included this year. At least I'd lean slightly that way. Uh, but I, I do still call this one a six on the boldness scale. Last one. Well, second to last one. How about this? Someone told me today we don't talk enough G5. Well, we'll stick this in your pipe and smoke it. Tristan said, Butch Jones, remember Coach Jones? He has a complete turnaround in year two. He leads the Arkansas State Red Wolves to six plus wins and a bowl win. Since I don't think you have this information on the tip of your tongue, allow me to remind you Arkansas State went two and ten last year in Butch Jones's first year, but they were one and five in one possession games. So you could sell me that maybe they just have that little bit of turnaround that equates to a monumental turnaround in the one possession loss category. Here's kind of the problem. They also lost by 18 points or more, I think five times. So it, it wasn't Nebraska, in other words. They weren't just losing a bunch of close games. Now they had the top recruiting class in the Sun Belt. They had a pretty good portal haul. I think they're still probably a year away from making that bowl leap. So I'm going to call this one an eight. They were two and 10. I mean, if they get to four or five wins even this year, that's really good progress. Let's give them one more year. So their over-under win total right now is five. That's a good year. Let's, let's try and push it up there. And this is not my advice to them, but let's try and push it up there. And then next year, that would be the year that I expect them to move. Then there was one more that I just wanted to hit on right quick because I, I laughed at this, but I got the sense that the person who sent it was not laughing. John said, Arch Manning, here's his bold prediction. Arch Manning is ranked as high as he is to distract the public from the behavior of the federal government, big food, and the military industrial complex. I could give you my response to this. I truly could. But why would I do that when I can just go over here to my research packet that Stats and Info, aka producer Jesse, provided me, and I'll read you what Jesse's notes said. <coughs> yes, our composite rankings set by getting an average from a number of other companies are all in cahoots. Come on, buddy. This is Jesse's notes to me. Come on, buddy. Arch is a dog. He has family mentors who have won four Super Bowls and comes from a lineage of great quarterbacks. He has the requisite height, 
mental aptitude, and athleticism to be the number one guy. Jesse's boldness scale, 20 out of 10. So there you have it. From producer Jesse's fingers through my lips to you, there is no government conspiracy working through the recruiting industry with Arch Manning. Though I would say, if the government were in cahoots with the recruiting industry, wouldn't the Mannings find a way to be involved somehow? Leave it at that. Let's move on. Oh, you know what it's time for? Another big announcement. Here we go. This one I take a special pleasure in uh, because I told you guys the other day it was time to announce the Late Kick Tour name for this fall. And I offered you a challenge. If any of you could guess what the Late Kick Tour name this fall is going to be, I don't know what it would be. I was going to give you something free. I cannot tell you how many thousand, yes, four-digit guesses we got on this, and not a one of you even came close. Everybody thought that it was going to be the Enlightenment Tour. Everybody thought that I was essentially, by naming last year's tour the Renaissance Tour, I was just going chronologically through history. That was never the goal. It was never even close to the thought process. So there were a lot of swing and misses on that front. I, truthfully, no one even came close. So here's the theme. And to remind you what this is, we got so many newcomers around here. We are in probably the most blessed position in the history of the world. We get to talk about college football Monday through Friday, or Sunday through Friday in the fall. And then on Saturday, I just get to go to whatever game I want to. And then we'll come back here and we'll talk about it. But we kind of shape it as a tour. I'll get in town Friday, see the sights, get to go to a lot of places I've never been before. Uh, we do live hits there on Saturday. And it's a whole experience. Last year, we called it the Renaissance Tour. And I explained the theme to you. This year's theme, before I give you the name, just let me tell you where my head's at and, and what we're going to be talking about a lot. You know what the NFL does really good? They're, they're brilliant marketers. They understand how to market their game and message and package their game. And they get a lot of help from Hollywood, you know? One of my favorite football movies has always been Any Given Sunday. I know a lot of you have at least seen the Pacino speech if you've never just seen the whole movie. I would advise you to go watch it. Great mechanics in the pocket from Jamie Foxx, gotta say. And that's kind of become a moniker for the NFL. You know, you got to watch pro football because any given Sunday something can happen. And there's always been this down-the-nose look at our game, especially from the casual crowd, that that's what the pro game has over you. It's any given Sunday in the NFL. And my whole stance the whole time in this show, if you watch this, you're probably right there along with me, is you don't get college football if you don't think every Saturday over here feels that way to us. It's just that what is special in college football may be a little different than what's special in the NFL. You know, believe it or not, there are folks who go to a stadium where their team's favored by 15 or 15-point underdogs, and there are things about that Saturday experience, or there are things in your living room or gathered around that radio in years past about that Saturday experience you love and you cherish. You only get 12 of them. You're only guaranteed 12 of them a year. And so if you understand college football... You understand, we got that same magic you think you've got a monopoly on on Sundays every Saturday. That's why we arrived on this year's tour name as the Every Given Saturday Tour. And I've got it being printed as we speak. And me and Big Game Dane, Big Game Dennis Dodd occasionally, and a host of others will be out on the road this fall. But the Every Given Saturday Tour even as submission after submission came in, was never beaten. I had a very concentrated focus group that I trusted with this, and there were some good submissions now, so much so that I've probably got the next four or five tours named. But this fall, every given Saturday, because that's what our entire theme is always about on Late Kick. We appreciate Saturday. We are regular season fanatics. Anything that comes after the regular season comes after the regular season. But we don't worry about playoff expansion around here because we love the regular season. Always have, always will. The Every Given Saturday Tour coming to a campus near you this fall. Recruiting, did I wind this up? Probably be worse than one day. Uh, recruiting has just been amazing. Last month and this month, and it will continue, recruiting is on fire right now. And so I wanted to hit a few things and just, just bear with me because we even had news breaking as we came in here. I mean, I got to put this in front of me so I remember to talk about Ohio State. So I know what Bucknuts will do to me if I do not talk about Ohio State. We need to talk about Jaden Brown first off. LSU. There was a lot of apprehension amongst some when Brian Kelly was hired in Baton Rouge. Is he going to be a fit? Remember that talk? More on that in just a second. I got to give a big hat tip to Andrew Ivins. He and Cooper Patagna do a really good show. I'd make sure I'm following that 24-7 sports recruiting account and 24-7 sports Twitter account. Um, 
they do a really good show. Ivan's was all over this thing, man. A couple of weeks ago, when it was thought that Brown was a lean elsewhere, there's Ivan's over there, just calm as he can be. You know, I'm, I'm kind of feeling LSU, kind of getting some LSU smoke around this. And all of a sudden, a couple of weeks later, there's Mr. Brown committing to LSU. Now, he's a, he's a high four-star receiver. I got some feedback on him. But first, I just want to reiterate that whole fit thing about Brian Kelly. Whether or not he has an authentic losing accent or not, it doesn't matter. If he can recruit, then he can win. And if he wins, then he's a fit. The end. That's the last sentence in the book. Last chapter. I got some intel on Mr. Brown there. They, uh, they tend to believe he will improve immensely. He's one of those guys that will disproportionately benefit from being in an SEC strength and conditioning program. Because as good as he is right now, he's a top popper. You know, very, very good straight line speed, can run the fly route all day on you, can play at this level right now. Got speed to play at this level right now. Probably a little overwhelmed from the physical aspect, but it's not something that he's maxed out at. In fact, he hasn't even scratched the surface up. So when they get him down there and they put him in that strength and conditioning program, he will explode there. And the short to intermediate route game, when he gets that down, that'll be a guy who looks very much the same as this conveyor belt of receivers that LSU has run off down there for the last several years. What about Oregon? Dante Moore. This was a huge one over the weekend. Dante Moore's the five-star quarterback from Michigan, from Detroit, actually. We saw him recently at Elite 11, commits to Oregon. Turns out Oregon made really good work of that trip by Mr. Moore to the West Coast recently. I remember, I'm old enough to remember when it felt like he was going to Michigan, or if he wasn't going to Michigan, he was going to Notre Dame. LSU was briefly in this thing, A&M, but it's Oregon. It's Dan Lanning, it's Kenny Dillingham, and those guys out at Oregon that end up locking him down. You can't overstate how huge this is for them now. His game... When you listen to our evaluators and you listen to even some of the NFL guys who have looked at him, they talk about two things. Number one, technically, his game is a little advanced relative to even some of the other elite quarterbacks out there. It's why I don't think our recruiting guys have just resigned themselves to Arch Manning being our number one quarterback. I still think that's very up in the air. Dante Moore could very well be in the running for that. The second thing they say is you look at him physically. He's there. He's college ready. And I stood about two feet from him and talked to him last week, interviewed him actually, and can confirm that. Really physically imposing, really physically impressive. Um, the, 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 the polish on the game, it's not something where you look at him and say, ooh, man, he's raw. Ooh, two years minimum. Red shirt him, that's not the situation. He'll be able to compete immediately at Oregon. Huge get for Dan Lanning. Think about this. My big question, I think yours too, when Dan Lanning, a defensive coordinator, goes from Georgia to Oregon, is the same as when Brent Venables goes from Clemson to Oklahoma. These defensive guys, these lifers on the defensive side of the ball, will they be able to attract elite quarterback talent? Well, short answer, yeah, pretty easily. We got Jackson Arnold, Elite 11 MVP, committed to Oklahoma. And then we got Dante Moore, who is in the running to be the top quarterback in the country overall, committed to Oregon. Two defensive-minded coaches having no problem whatsoever recruiting elite quarterback talent. Jaden Wayne. We talked about him at the beginning of the show. Now I just want to talk about the player for a second, not talk about the off-the-field, on-web drama. This is Miami's second-highest-rated commit right now. He's a top-50 edge guy. I told you he's from IMG. You know all that about him. I did not know this, though. IMG plays him at receiver some. Tight end receiver. So much so that, I mean, there's been some talk in the industry about listing him at that position. Well, the reason I say that is because in the evaluator's mind, you look at that and you say, he's already that good. He's not really even focused on that position exclusively. He also plays basketball. So there is a strong consensus from evaluators that when he gets to Miami and he's just focused on that position alone, as much as he's already highly rated and as good as he already looks, as big as he already is, probably another notch or two that he can take it up just by being focused solely on that position. Miami is going to, I think, at this point, easily sign the highest rated class they've had in the 24-7 era. I saw David Lake on Inside the U earlier today. I think he wrote that very thing. They are now easily on track under Mario Cristobal in his first full cycle to sign their highest rated class. How there was ever any doubt about that is beyond me. We move on. Peter Woods to Clemson. This happened a couple of days ago. This one's really big. Uh, there is, there's nothing hidden about this. I know when you see a five-star defensive player 
from Birmingham, not going to Alabama, you think, what's the deal? Character? Grades? None of that. He wanted to play at Clemson more than he wanted to play at Alabama. Now, uh, that's one thing that appears on the surface to be true right now. Certainly, Alabama will not back off their recruitment of him. Uh, I have no reason to believe that that's going to change. But I'm just saying, I don't think Alabama is going to wave the white flag just because he committed in July. Having said that, big pickup for Dabo Swinney. They have just owned it. Re Clemson has so totally and thoroughly owned defensive line recruiting. He's versatile was the word that I had a lot of guys text to me. The versatility that they've gotten before at Clemson. It's, I mean, it's when you recruit athletes at that level, normally they are versatile. They like those guys that really they could project all along their defensive front. Peter Woods is a guy that is the caliber that even at Clemson, they can project him all along their defensive front. So, hey, there has been no shortage of evidence to shut you up so far if you believe that Clemson was going to fall off in recruiting since a lot of those coaches left. I mean, they're number, number three in the country right now in the 24-7 team recruiting rankings behind only Notre Dame and Ohio State. You notice that team at the top just changed in the last hour. I'll talk about that in just a second. Hey, uh, you see who's number five there? Uh, if you're listening on podcast, you don't. The Tennessee Volunteers are the number five team currently in the 24-7 sports team recruiting rankings. And that wasn't the case when we woke up this morning. But that's because they added another five-star commit. And that's him right there. Shindavian Bradley, just in the last few hours, committed. That's a top 50 player by, I, I think, the consensus in the industry is uh, top 50. Man, they got, I think they got two of the top 10 edge guys committed now, by the way. So it's not just that they're stocking up on a bunch of receiver and running back talent up there. They're getting some really good talent at multiple positions. Uh, they got Selden committed the other day. He's a really high, highly rated athlete, too, four-star athlete. And all of a sudden, there's Josh Heupel in Tennessee. I guess if you're a Tennessee hater, you wanted to sell yourself on the idea that last year was just the sugar high, sort of a, a Red Bull effect, if you will. I'll use all the short-term metaphors I can to suggest that some people think Tennessee was going to be a flash in the pan. I, I can't promise you what they will or won't do on the field this year, but man, in recruiting, they're doing a lot right now. Number five. So then the, the obvious pushback, I know it's coming in the comment section, is where's a long way to sign today? Yeah, well, before pen hits paper, nothing's official. I know that. You know who that's also true for? Every team listed in front of them. Every team listed behind them. So let's, let's get the obvious out of the way, and let's just acknowledge this is a really, really good recruiting class being put together by Josh Heupel in Tennessee so far. Oh, and by the way, Oklahoma, big day for them too. Okay, this is it. This is what Jesse and I practiced on. P.J. Adabare. Yeah, sounds pretty good. Uh, he is also a four-star edge guy from Kansas City that within the last hour and a half committed to Oklahoma. Uh, that's their fourth top 100 commit. Oklahoma now is a number 11 in the team ranking, so they're floating right there outside the top 10. Uh, they were 13th, I think, before his commitment. So I've got 13 written down on my piece of paper. They've already moved up. I guess we updated the rankings, which shows you someone's on the clock this weekend, as it turns out. Hey, uh, Oklahoma is knocking it out of the park. And if you'll remember signing day, Oklahoma, who had just lost Lincoln Riley like five minutes ago and Brent Venables walks in, they ended up having one of the highest rated classes, Lincoln Riley or not, in the last several years. So now we get to see the follow-up. And if early indications are any indication, a little redundant, uh, I think it looks good. Okay, good news. I remember to talk about Ohio State. The Buckeyes, as of about an hour ago, have the number one class in the country. They added Jason Moore. He is a top 10 defensive lineman nationally. Number one class in the country. You want to know how? If I can give you a padlock stat so far as to how Ryan Day and his staff have gotten that number one class in the country. One way is just have Heartline on the staff, period. Uh, but number two is have 14 of your 18 commitments be top 247 players. That is a pretty darn good strategy by the month of July to have the number one class. Not locked up but have the number one class. So Ohio State's not going anywhere, but up. Uh, recruiting is so amazing right now. I know some of you out there, especially who, who grew up in the old school way of doing things, which only changed like uh, yesterday, you're not used to paying attention to recruiting in July. If you're not paying attention to recruiting in July, in the summer, nowadays, it is like missing January 10 years ago. I mean, January was when you were hitting refresh every five minutes. That is recruiting now. That, that period, especially since the early signing days in December, a lot of kids want to get it out of their way before their senior season. And the only time to do that is right now. 
So, man, that, that, that visit weekend at the end of June is huge. Recruiting and now commitment season in July, it's huge. So that's big for them. We got another big announcement to get to. Big announcement after big announcement after big announcement. It's the kind of show we like. So thank you for being tuned in. Hey, you know what? Quick, very quick um, favor I need to ask. Jesse tells me when I did this the other night, we had like 500 likes. If you have not liked the video, we got like 2,700 of you watching right now. We got about 524 likes. Just hit the thumbs up button. That's it. Subscribe if you haven't already, but hit the thumbs up button. Okay. In our business, this thing we do, this sports media thing, you either got it one of two ways. You either do it how I used to do it, which is independent, and you own your channel, but it's really not worth a whole heck of a lot, or a really big media company comes along and gives you a golden opportunity, which 24-7 and CBS gave me a little over two years ago. But in exchange, that thing right there, that logo I'm pointing at if you're listening on a podcast, that's not yours anymore. This stuff that we're doing, the moment we, the moment we close it up, it's not ours. We don't own that footage. We don't own that audio. Ownership is an illusion when you come into this world. Daddy owns it. It's the first and last time I'll ever say that on the show uh, because Daddy writes your paycheck for you. And so in exchange, they're going to own all this IP, those letters, intellectual property, they own it. Um, which leads me to our next announcement. We own the show now. It's our show. Late Kick's our show now. Uh, because we have been able to talk with management, talk with CBS over the past several months. And as of this week, I'm not going to bore you with all those details. As of this week, this YouTube channel, we own it. The podcast feed, we own it. That logo, we own it. This show, you and I, we own it. You'll notice that there was a transition a couple of weeks ago on YouTube where this channel became named Late Kick. And there is a new 24-7 sports channel. Well, that's the reason. We own it. It's ours. From now until eternity, if you need to know where to find this thing, no matter who my employer is, this is it. This is home. Can't promise you we won't build out from it. Uh, that'll be long down the road. We own it now. Ownership is, like I said, kind of a unicorn. And the fact that we were able to get this is monumental. And I keep saying we, 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 even though you just see one person sitting here, because there was no prayer that I could ever do this if you did not scale this show so quickly and as violently, really, as you did. Show shouldn't be as big as it is right now, especially when we started in a pandemic. But it is because of you. So I always am eternally grateful for that. But I'm also especially appreciative of our folks at CBS here because, man, that's, that's very atypical. And they were willing to not only listen, but kind of get creative with a framework of the way to, to make this thing operate. And look, the bottom line is they've seen return on investment from you. And I think that we stand to see a lot more of it because of you. It's our channel now. It's our show now, like it was back in Columbus, Georgia. So thank you so much for that. That means a lot for us. But boy, I got something coming in a few minutes that means a whole lot more for you than it does any of us. So stay tuned. Uh, September swing games. Next up, weeks three and four. We hit weeks one and two last week. If you missed that video, check it out on the YouTube channel. I'm going to start in week three. I'm going to go to a game we actually... Kind of slightly touched on a few minutes ago. Columbia, South Carolina, week three. What will Williams Bryce Stadium be like? Spoiler alert, it'll be really loud. Georgia goes to South Carolina week three. That's the first swing game I want to talk about. Um, it makes a difference when you play these conference road games, especially in the SEC. See, sometimes if you've got a team that's got a few losses under their belt, you get later in the year, or those fans wake up that Saturday morning and they're playing one of the top teams in the country. They're still going to show up. They're still going to turn the game on. But, boy, if you've got a few losses under your belt already, your feet hit the ground in the morning and it's, whew, here we go. But not in week three. In week three, you've got the whole world in front of you. In week three, even if you're not going to end up a top 25 team, your fan base probably doesn't know it yet. Your players in the locker room certainly don't know it yet. Your coaching staff doesn't know it yet. That's why it's important that South Carolina gets Georgia in week three. Where's South Carolina going to be, though? If you're looking at their schedule like we are right now, they got Georgia State in week one. Should be a win. But week two, they go to Arkansas, which, of course, presents this, this very interesting fork in the road. They could either be coming in sky high and, and for all I know, have the, the CBS game of the week. I think Penn State Auburn's got it that week. But point being, this could be a marquee game all of a sudden in week three, undefeated versus undefeated, or South Carolina could lose to Arkansas, at which point they're in the wounded animal spot. 
wounded animal mode, going back home with last year's national champ coming in. As for Georgia, the whole swing part of this is you find out if they're going to get clipped on the road like Bama did last year as a three-touchdown favorite. If they're, are they going to have wiggle room the whole way? You know, are they going to go into that Florida game undefeated? Are they going to, are they going to go into that late back-to-back -back road game stretch at Mississippi State, at Kentucky? Are they going to be undefeated there? Or are they already going to play Florida and Tennessee with a loss? Because then you have no more wiggle room. It's, it's kind of do-or-die time as it, as it relates to your playoff hopes. So that's the first swing game. Second swing game, also in week three, and we've talked about this one a lot already, that's Oklahoma at Nebraska. This is not a conference game. I know it looks that way because you're used to those logos meaning something in a former life that they don't mean anymore. But this is a big game. It's a rivalry game. Now, they played this game last year, and it was a 23-16 game. The current line on this game is 3.5 to 4.5, depending on where you look. Oklahoma favored. So they're going to Lincoln. They figure to be a slight favorite. Here's what I'm going to do for just a second. I'm going to assume a couple of things. I'm going to assume that Oklahoma will be 2-0 in this game. To achieve that, they just have to beat UTEP and Kent State. I am going to do something far bolder, and I'm going to assume that Nebraska is going to be 3-0. Nebraska plays a week zero game. I'm going to assume, boy, I start sweating just saying this. I'm going to assume Nebraska is going to beat Northwestern, North Dakota, and Georgia Southern. Chills. Uh, if that happens, this is a huge game. This is a game the whole country will be watching. And it's not necessarily a game Nebraska has to win, but man, it kind of, sort of, a little bit is, only because of the unique circumstances around Nebraska. None of those folks are interested in coming close. They, they own a trademark on one possession losses in Lincoln, Nebraska. They don't want to come close. They came close last year in Oklahoma's building, 23-16. to 16. A lot of folks... Nationally say, man, Nebraska should have won that game. I don't use that language, especially with Nebraska, because if I used should have with them, I get they should have been a playoff team because they had eight of nine losses by one possession last year. My point is, this is Scott Frost's opportunity. This is his chance to announce to the world, this year's different. Because all due respect, you don't prove that playing half a world away in Ireland against Northwestern. Nor do you against North Dakota, nor do you against Clay Helton, and Georgia Southern. In case you didn't know, there's a preview magazine special for you. Clay Helton, the head coach in Statesboro now. No, you prove it in week four against Oklahoma. Selfishly, I want it to be an undefeated matchup because I want to be there. Week four swing game, number uh, one, is Arkansas against Texas A&M. You know, I always regrettably put the neutral site games on here. This is one I was at last year. This one grabbed the national attention on Arkansas last year. Yeah, they, they beat Texas in week two. That was more a local thing. Like, they were on fire about it, but everyone nationally just said, oh, there goes Texas doing Texas stuff again. No, it was week four. It was when they beat A&M 20 to 10 out there in Arlington. That's when you saw that celebration on the field. Some of those dudes were crying on the field, which again is why every given Saturday is what we believe in in college football. And sure enough, they're going to have a chance to do it again this year. Now, Arkansas will have already played South Carolina at home by the time this game goes down in week four. And they will have already played Cincinnati at home to start the season. A couple of tough games, a couple of games that they believe they should win. And they should. They'll be favored at home. A&M will have played App State and Miami both at home before they go into this game. It's a swing game for obvious reasons because this is where the SEC West really starts to sort itself out behind Alabama but you don't have to be behind Bama, but you both have to play them eventually. You need to find out whose game against Bama is going to mean more. See, A&M, they beat Bama last year. It didn't even matter because they had multiple losses. So do you have one or fewer losses when you face them? Like Arkansas plays Bama the week after this game. A&M goes to Bama two weeks after that game. Whose game will mean more against Alabama? Big swing game there. Also in week four, also in the same conference, Florida at Tennessee. We have uh, spoken at great length about what this would mean to that rivalry if both teams were undefeated. It's a tough road to get there. Not impossible, though. This is kind of the East version of that A&M Arkansas game, if you really think about it. Neither one of these teams is favored to win the division, but they're sitting there kind of stacked up behind Georgia, like A&M and Arkansas are stacked up behind Bama. They're solid enough teams. Um, they're kind of, at this point in the season, they're far enough away from the shore where there's no turning back. It's week four. 
So you are who you are. Uh, Florida will have already played Utah and Kentucky by that point. Tennessee will have already played at Pitt. With Florida especially, have they beaten Kentucky already? Did they beat Kentucky and Gainesville? If they did, they go in here, you beat Tennessee, man. You set yourself up. Where it's you in Georgia. That's what it is. Tennessee's the same way. If they beat Florida, all of a sudden they look at their schedule and they can't blink because they go to LSU the next week and they got Bama the week after that. Florida starts looking ahead to the Georgia game probably is how their perspective works after this thing. Tennessee, they can't afford to look ahead at all. Uh, they got uh, the most treacherous road trip of the year the week after, and then they got Bama the week after that. But the thing about it is you want that Bama game, same way with Arkansas and A&M, to mean a lot. If you beat them, you want it to be consequential. You don't want to already have one or multiple losses on your schedule. Uh, the last one in week four is an interesting one that I think is a little off the radar for most people. It's Notre Dame at North Carolina. But think about who the Irish play in week one. They play at Ohio State. They are a two-touchdown underdog to Ohio State. So if we just go by odds-making logic and figure that Notre Dame catches an L in week one, I mean, this is the next most dangerous road game they have until the end of the year when they go to USC. They could go into Chapel Hill knowing we can't drop another game or we're out of the playoff picture. And there's no really conference championship picture to speak of there. Uh, with, with North Carolina, too, they will play a bunch of anonymous teams nationally until this point. So they were an underachiever last year. They'll be kind of anonymous because they got Florida A&M at App State, at Georgia State. That's got to be typos. Who in the world agreed to that? Jesse, please tell me those are typos. Is it, is it true? Are they going to play at Georgia State in, in what used to be Turner Field, by the way? I digress. Wh whomst am I? to challenge your schedule-making practices. But oh, he says it's true. <sighs> anyway, um, they should win the games regardless. They are anonymous. Like, you don't care if they beat the, the Florida A&M or App State or Georgia State. You don't know anything about them until they play Notre Dame. Point being, if North Carolina is ever going to be in ambush mode this year, if they're going to pull one out of nowhere, that's it. That Notre Dame game in week four. So those are five more swing games for you just in the month of September. I... um. I, like, I, I keep looking, as I told you last week, I kept looking at the whole season. I wanted to do a whole season segment. We've done two of them. We haven't even gotten out of September yet. Which kind of reminds me of something. In fact, let's do the Q&A right quick. I got a question from one of you guys. And um, let's tee it up here. Nicholas asked, how can fans help protect what makes this sport special? We talk about swing games so much. Every given Saturday is the name of the tour this fall. I'll tell you what you can do, Nicholas. The first thing you can do to protect college football is define what it means to you. We're big about that on this show. You know, we got, we got a lens that you and I look through the sport with, that we grew up with, that sometimes the casuals don't have, sometimes a TV executive doesn't have it, sometimes your bosses don't have, but we got it. Define it, and then don't let anyone change it. I, I sometimes, in a former life, used to get worked up when I'd scroll websites and whatnot, and I looked at folks who used to cover pro ball, and they only recently got assigned to college football, and I could tell they didn't love it, and I could, it just bled through the screen. I used to get worked up about that. I'm not letting them dictate what matters to me, nor should you. Don't let anyone else dictate what matters to you. And, and especially when we get into September and then early October, where no one has any business talking about the playoff, and you're turning on certain networks, and every other TV timeout, and every other... Every other commercial break and every other post-game show, you got segments or talking points about the playoff. How does this impact the playoff? Just mute it. Just don't pay attention to it. Don't let someone convince you that the only games that matter are the ones with playoff implications attached to them. That erases the fun of 95% of the sport. And so to us on this show, we don't even talk about the playoff until November. That's really when we start talking about it. Uh, the next thing I would say is... Remember to properly honor Saturday, like properly appreciate the regular season. That's what you're guaranteed, first off. And secondly, the stuff that falls outside of the purview of the championship races and the playoff races, in a lot of cases, is what makes the sport so great. That's why once upon a time, I'm talking to my college audience for the moment, once upon a time, whether you believe it or not, you could watch a Wake Forest Georgia Tech game in early November and both teams already have multiple losses. And yet, if you just watch that game, those groups of fans are worked up about it. And they're excited because 
The preview magazine said they're a five-win team this year, but maybe one of them's on track to win not just six, but maybe seven or eight games. Not only are we going to potentially get a bowl game, we could get a Florida bowl game. All this conversation used to matter because there was a proper understanding of how many tiers of measurement there were in this sport. Now there's two. You're a playoff team or you're terrible. You're a playoff team or you're irrelevant. You're a playoff team or you're playing meaningless games in November. Honor Saturdays and honor the regular season and marry that with the first part, which is define what matters to you and then don't let any casuals convince you otherwise. Thirdly, on a related note, just ignore the casuals entirely. One of the main reasons we created this show is because I was a viewer, I was a consumer, I was a civilian. I was a college football fan civilian. And I looked around and I thought the space sucked. I didn't think there was anyone out there who was speaking to me. And I knew I wasn't alone. I worked in the fabric warehouse down in Columbus. All we talked about was college football. What we were saying around that fabric table sounded nothing like what was on talk radio or what was on TV at the time. I'd go to lunch at Clearview Barbecue down in Columbus, Georgia, Monday through Friday. I'd eat with my buddies. Our conversation revolved around college football. It sounded nothing like anything that was on talk radio. It sounded nothing like anything that was on TV. So then, I think I have a little bit of ability in this arena. I say, hey, man, streaming, the barriers have been broken down. We can create our own show now. Why don't I do something about it? And we built Late Kick, and you took it from there. Uh, that's kind of the way we build this thing. A lot of casuals out there. And we kind, of, we kind of fancy ourselves as the exclusive distributor of casual spray. It could be something that we sell one day. You know, just go buy an aerosol can, put our own label on it, empty it out first. In an environmentally sound way, of course. We don't want all sorts of three-letter regulators on our tail. But just ignore the casuals. That's the simple advice. Just ignore casuals in football and in life. And the fourth thing is you got to protect your traditions because they'll always come for them. They'll either, they'll either tell you they're stupid or your rivals don't deserve to be listened to anyway. But uh, other folks will tell you your traditions, like at Notre Dame right now, the way you value independence, it doesn't work. It's Hulk Hogan. It doesn't work for me, brother. It doesn't work. We want you in a conference because we want everything to be congruent and harmonious and homogenized just like their, the pro game is on Sundays. And uh, like I said the other night, I grew up not liking Notre Dame. But boy, I've come to respect the way they do things now because I wish more people would adhere strongly to their values and tradition, even if everyone else hates it. It's not for everyone. Notre Dame's not for everyone. Miami's not for everyone. Texas is not for everyone. Defend your traditions, especially against people who are just drive-bys. They have no attachment to your university. They have no attachment to your program. They just want to see the world burn. And after they burn your special thing down, They'll just move on like locusts. Once they've devoured whatever's special to you, they'll just go to the next field and devour their crop. So don't pay attention to them, is my simple advice. You gotta define what it means to you. You gotta honor Saturday and the regular season. You gotta avoid casuals and you gotta protect your traditions. That is how you keep the sport special. I hope everyone heard that. Uh, the last announcement that I would like to give you tonight is one, oh boy. Look at that chat. Um, thank you for being tuned in live. So about 10 minutes ago, I told you it's our show. We own it now. Why is that so important? Well, I kind of explained it to you, but there is something that from the day I got here to present day, you've asked me about not only every week, not only every day, every hour, multiple times per hour. If I could show you my email inbox and my DMs, there's one thing that you ask me about more than any other thing related to this show. It's five letters, merch, which is short for merchandise. And for two years, I have had to kick the can down the road and I've had to give you nonsense responses because I had no answer for you. Would I love to be able to sell things related to this show? Sure. You know what the problem was? We didn't own the show. As of last week, guess what changed? We own the show. And as of this Friday, it is go time. We're opening the Late Kick store. Everything you've ever wanted to purchase, everything you've wanted to sell, because trust me, I've had time to compile about a million and one ideas, will be right there for your purchasing pleasure. This Friday, we are going to hit launch on that thing. You follow me on social. You look at the links on the show. We will have the link to that store for you. 
but the late kick store is a go full ready for launch. I'm excited. I'll probably buy like 50 things on day one. So everyone around here has got to make money. Uh, the wait is over. So tell your mom, tell your grandma, tell your friends, probably even have gift cards in there if you want to buy something for someone for Christmas. We had a lot of major announcements tonight. Let me reiterate one more time. That is because of you. Every single thing, every box we're able to check is because of you. Thank you guys so much, not only for me, but for our entire crew here. I mean, we're able to hire more people around here because of you. So we're in mid-July right now. Feels like it's the middle of the season. Imagine what this season is going to be like. Make sure you're tuned in. Subscribe if you haven't already, and subscribe to those podcast feeds too. This Friday, finally, merch. I'm still wearing my white t-shirt, but I, I, I want you to be able to wear whatever you want to associated with the show. For producer, Jesse. For director, Colin. Our entire crew here, even management. I'm Josh Pate. Thanks so much for making all this possible. Have a great start to your week, and God bless.